for the ancient Greeks and Romans, sacrifice was always the supreme act of piety. Some thought that the gods were nourished by sacrificial smoke. Others speculated that they liked the smell or simply appreciated the gesture. Whatever the reason, it was agreed that sacrifice was the single most effective means of restraining the gods' wrath and gaining their favor. Honeyed cakes, incense, bowls of wine, and a whole host of other bloodless offerings could be and were made to the gods. Animals, however, were always preferred. The most affordable were piglets and chickens. More common, though also more expensive, were sheep, goats, and pigs. The costliest and most prestigious were oxen, which often had their horns gilded for the occasion. Although almost any animal could be offered to almost any god, each deity had his or her preferred victims. Demeter was fond of piglets. Aphrodite liked doves. Hecate insisted on dogs. The Greeks and Romans agreed that human sacrifice was barbaric. The most notorious practitioners were the Carthaginians, who offered children to the god Baal. The Gauls were said to build colossal wicker men, pack them with prisoners, and burn them to honor the gods. The Germans sacrificed men over a great bronze cauldron. When the cauldron was full, it was tipped over, and a priestess drew prophecies from the patterns made by the spilling blood. The Taurians sacrificed any Greek unfortunate enough to be shipwrecked on their shores, impaling the heads of their victims on long lines of stakes beside the sea. The Greeks and Romans believed that their distant ancestors had also performed human sacrifices. In several myths, the gods demanded human victims. Agamemnon, for example, was forced to offer his daughter Iphigenia to Artemis before he could sail for Troy, and Achilles saw fit to fling twelve sacrificed Trojans onto the funeral pyre of Patroclus. Many cities celebrated rituals that had, or were assumed to have, roots in human sacrifice. In some cases, humans had been replaced by other victims. The Romans explained their odd habit of sacrificing a fish, an onion, and a hare after lightning strikes as the symbolic equivalent of human sacrifice. In other cases, human victims had been supplanted by effigies. Fourteen planks dressed as women were burned in a towering fire at one Greek festival. Every year, likewise, the Romans tossed straw puppets, bound hand and foot, into the Tiber. Although there were scattered instances of human sacrifice in the classical world, the evidence is disputed. Modern historians are skeptical, for example, about the ancient claim that an Athenian general sacrificed three members of the Persian royal family to Dionysus. Academic suspicion also surrounds the best candidate for regular human sacrifice in ancient Greece. In the remote region of Arcadia, high on a barren ridge of Mount Lycaon, stood an ancient sanctuary of Zeus. There, every four years, a boy was sacrificed in the dead of night upon a mound of blood-soaked ash, or so it was said. Most of the human sacrifices mentioned in Roman sources, likewise, can be chalked up to rumor or slander. The rebel Catiline supposedly swore his co-conspirators to secrecy over the entrails of a sacrificed boy, and then, for good measure, ate them. Augustus was said to have sacrificed no fewer than 300 Roman captives to the deified Julius Caesar. There is no compelling reason to believe either of these stories. Occasionally, however, the Romans really did perform a human sacrifice. At least three times, in periods of national crisis, four victims, two Greeks and two Gauls, were buried alive just outside the gates of Rome. The custom was finally banned, along with all other forms of human sacrifice, in 97 BC. Human sacrifice, in short, was rare. Other forms of ritual murder were more widespread. Some Greek cities, for example, chose one or two exceptionally ugly men as pharmakoi, scapegoats, each year. On a set day, these men were expelled from the city, being beaten, whipped, and or stoned in the process. Sometimes, if we can believe our sources, they were killed. The ritual seems, however, 
to have become more humane over time. At one Greek city, where a pharmakos was annually flung from a seaside cliff, the custom developed of supplying the victim with large wings and a flock of live birds on strings to slow his descent. After he crashed, birds and all, into the sea, he would be picked up in a small boat and escorted outside the city's territory. Although the Roman scapegoating festival, which involved dressing an old man in animal skins and beating him with rods, was non-fatal, Romans were more than willing to engage in ritual murder when it suited them. On the day a general triumphed, for example, it was customary for the enemy commander or king to be ceremonially strangled. Even more dramatically, Roman generals could surrender their own lives to the gods to win critical battles. During one minor festival, finally, the blood of men killed in the arena was supposedly poured over a statue of Jupiter. The strange case of the priest-king of Nemi encapsulates the ambiguous status of ritual murder in the classical world. Lake Nemi, about 20 miles from Rome, lies in a deep volcanic crater ringed by woods. Its shady shores were a summer retreat of the Roman emperors. Caligula built two colossal pleasure barges, each almost 250 feet long, so that he could cruise the cool waters in suitable magnificence. At a slight remove from this splendor lay an ancient grove sacred to Diana. The priest of the sanctuary, called the King of Nemi, was always an escaped slave. The only way to become King of Nemi was to kill the previous king in single combat. For centuries, as slaves fought and died in the quiet grove, scholars speculated about the custom, ascribing it to barbarian influence in a distant past. Caligula, drifting by on one of his vast barges, amused himself by hiring a thug to attack the current king. For most, however, the king of Nemi was merely an unpleasant reminder that the gods sometimes welcomed human blood. I have a new book, Insane Emperors, Sunken in Cities, and Earthquake Machines. More frequently asked questions about the ancient Greeks and Romans. It's a sequel to Naked Statues, Vac Gladiators, and War Elephants, and it's available for pre-order now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and through your local bookstore. If you're interested in more Told and Stone content, including my podcast, check out my channel, Told and Stone Footnotes. I also have a channel called Scenic Roots to the Past, which is dedicated to historically-themed travel. You'll find both channels linked in the description. Last but not least, please consider joining other viewers in supporting Told and Stone on Patreon. Thanks for watching.